This is Frank Zappa. You're listening to DeBella. I've got his phone number uh, at home is here, he up Shark. Now? Well, uh, uh, from from what Gail, his wife, said mm -hmm. uh, when, when she called the other day, he said, "Don't worry, he's going to be working in the studio all night." Mm -hmm. So it's about what three in the morning there, three something. No, what am I talking about? It's about six, six hours. Quarter there. to six. It's about a quarter to six. So uh, let's just go to the phone here and dial him up. And uh, of course, this is Los Angeles. And uh, so, uh, obviously, he lives in the 213 part of Los Angeles, not the 818 part of is Los Angeles. Is there an 818? Yeah, there is. They divided it up uh, like they did with New York as well, as a matter of fact. And uh, let's talk to Frank. Hello, Frank Zappa. Hello, this is Frank Zappa. Yeah, this is Gail Sayers. Hi, Gail. Hi, John DeBella and Mark the Shark from WMMR in Philadelphia. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you? <laughs> Good morning. I've been up all day and all night. <laughs> what are you working on? Well, I'm trying to finish this album. I, I, I'm not sure, but I might be able to get it out in time for Christmas. I've missed just about all of the deadlines that uh, I was supposed to have for the artwork and everything to, to make the Christmas release. But uh, I'm hoping that I can uh, pull something out of the hat and get this thing ready in time for Christmas. Uh, what, it, what is this new album? The album is called Frank Zappa Meets the Mothers of Prevention. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess, it's got songs like Gory Details and Baker's Dozen on it. Well, how about um, <laughs> Ilian Orifice? <laughs> and uh, one of them is called What's New in Baltimore. <laughs> one of them called Yo Cats, Little Beige Sambo. And uh, let's see, uh, Turning Again. Frank, did you ever think that the day would come that you would be speaking in front of a congressional committee? Uh, no. <laughs> what was that like? Uh, here, we, we only got to hear a little bit of it. Here in Philadelphia, there's no cable TV, so we can't watch the Senate hearings. And whatever popped up on network TV is what we got to see. Well, and, what you saw on network television, there's no resemblance to what actually happened there. Uh, can you fill us in on some of it? Well, sure. I'll be it would be my pleasure to tell you what happened there. First of all, the there was conflicting reports as to whether or not the hearing was supposed to lead to um, legislation when i first went there the reason i went there is because it was my understanding that they were having a hearing in order to decide whether or not these ridiculous demands would be turned into some kind of law and i would fight that mm -hmm. so the day before the uh, hearing i debated senator danforth on the cbs morning news and he he was the chairman of the committee and uh, he was just saying the same things the ladies always say, you know, the usual stuff. And uh, after the cameras went off, I, I said, do you really believe in Satanism and all this stuff that you're talking about? And he said, well, I'm really not very well informed about this matter. But during the interview on the television, he said, no, this is definitely not for uh, legislation. This is only to provide a public forum to uh, ventilate the issue. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. And also at that time, he claimed to be totally unaware of the blank tape tax and all the rest of that stuff. So we get to the hearing the next morning. He reiterates, this is not for legislation. It is only to ventilate the issue. As soon as he's done saying that, Senator Hollings gets on there and says, if I could do away with all of this music constitutionally, I would. And I'm going to be looking for a way to do it. And Senator Exon said, here is a senator who is interested in legislation. So you don't really know what what's lurking in these guys' minds. Uh, Gore said that he's not interested in legislation, but one of the reasons why people say they're not interested in legislation, even the, the ladies said that they're not interested in it. I did a little checking, and I found out they have a tax-free number, uh -huh. which is how they send out their fundraising letter. Mm -hmm. Under this tax-free number, they are not allowed to seek legislation, or they lose their tax-free status. They can't lobby for legislation or raise money for legislation. So they have to say they don't want it. But I don't believe for a minute that any of those people don't want legislation. They'd love to clamp rock and roll down tight as a drum. Now, now, Frank, is this anything different than we've seen over the years? In the 50s, it was Elvis. In the 60s, it was the Beatles and drugs and the Stones and sex. And then in the 70s, it was the whole punk rock movement. And there always seems to be somebody up against rock and roll in one way or another. Do you see this drastically different? Well, have you seen it in, in uh, the Senate before? Uh, no. <laughs> so that's drastically different? Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, also, uh, a ways back, uh, before you had Elvis and all this stuff, you had the McCarthy hearings. Remember that? Oh, yes. A wonderful witch hunt. We are heading in that direction. First of all, you got a president who used to be deeply involved in that kind of stuff, as you might know. Right. And right. Agent X, whatever his name was. Yeah, right. <laughs> King of the Screen Actors Guild. So I, the whole aroma of the thing is... is not too pleasant. And the other thing that disturbs me is, did you see the uh, the story in the Village Voice? No. The, f the cover story in the Village Voice last week was Sympathy for the Devil. Has the record industry sold its soul to the censors? And it's a story written by Dave Marsh, who was a rock critic. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did a bunch of research on this thing, and he came up with stuff that I, I'd never even heard of before. For example, in my statement to the Congress, I said this that there is a conflict of interest because three of the senators sitting on this committee have wives in the PMRC. I find out uh, last Friday when I did a radio show with uh, Dave Marsh, we were on uh, the, uh, the Bream show on ABC, we uh -huh. three hours on the phone. He told me that I was too short. There's five. And the reason I didn't know about the other two is because nobody had the real tally of how many of these women are married to senators. He got a hold of the original PMRC letter, and there's 16 names on it, and they're all signed over their husband's names. And I called the PMRC head office uh, the Friday before the hearing, and I asked them this question. How many of the wives in the PMRC have husbands who are senators? And you know what the lady said? I, 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 I'm going to venture to say none. Well, no, <laughs> but uh, it was almost as good. You know what she said? The, the PMRC has no members. We have only founders. Oh, so, so nobody's following them. They're just a small group of five people? Well, <laughs> actually four is what's on their letterhead because they got a copy of their fundraising letter. That's why I know all this stuff. I have, I have tried to get information from the PMRC, and it's been to no avail. Uh, I can't get anything back from them, which is kind of strange because here I am in a position where I play these so-called records, and uh, I can't even get any information, even if I was on their side. Well, the, where have you been calling? Their office? Their office in Washington. Well, we'll start calling Senator Gore's office. He's got nothing better to do. <laughs> Franco, what other musical artists are as involved in this as you are? Well, I don't think there's any of them that are doing the same type of things that I'm doing because I've you know, invested a lot of my own time and money into doing this thing. I've got a, a mailing that we've sent out to a bunch of people, and uh, you know, I've got the lawyers that uh, I've been working on with this thing, and I've really been out there whacking it for the last eight weeks, doing an average of five interviews a day and uh, just fighting it every way that I could. But there are other musicians that hate it. They just haven't opened their mouth about it. Now, now one of the things, a lot of people are getting, uh, you know, bits and pieces of this whole PMRC and rating records story. Uh, people who want to get behind it, and that, that tends to be one of the biggest problems. People go, yeah, I don't like that, but don't do anything about it. What can the average Joe on the street do about the well, PMRC? The, the way that you're going to have to fight it, l let me tell you what you're going to have to fight, just so you understand how, how wretched this thing is. Because the, the rating of records is just the beginning. Because the PMRC formed and started making all this noise, and because the media jumped on it, <clears throat> and gave them vast amounts of TV time with nobody speaking against them. You know, mm -hmm. had virtual run of the run of the video for the last six weeks with nobody on their case. And uh, every time that I would do an interview for anything that was taped, they would edit me down to like one line and then, then the ladies would have the, the whole rest of the show. But what happened as a result of that is in San Antonio, Texas, there is a situation where the mayor and the city council are trying to pass PMRC type regulations regarding live concerts. That means that, um, and they've been challenged by the ACLU on this, mm -hmm. but Cisneros, who is the mayor, is trying to make a national name for himself by making San Antonio the first city in the United States to have ratings on live concerts. So in order to get around the First Amendment question, they're going at it uh, as a health matter, and they've hired a psychologist who, within the next 30 days, is going to make a recommendation to the city council and suggest the minimum age at which it would be helpful for a person to see a rock concert. And based on the psychologist's um, recommendation, they are then going to enact ordinances to put that into effect.
That's sick. <laughs> it's sick, but it gets worse because once that becomes an ordinance in San Antonio, every other right-wing community in the United States is going to adopt that as a model ordinance. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's coming up you know, in the next few months that you better worry about that you're going to have to fight. So here's what I've been urging people to do. The 18-year-old uh, kid who can vote probably has no interest in doing it because it's not fashionable, you know, there's nothing exciting about going into a, a little booth and, you know, putting a mark on a piece of paper or pushing a button or whatever it is in your state. But I'm telling you, you're going to have to register and you're going to have to vote because it's the only way to clean up on these guys. If we start um, just repeating over and over again, register, go register, mm -hmm. Pay attention to, to the local elections, not just uh, what happens every time that you go for the president, but you have to watch happen, what happens in the local elections, because if you don't take an interest in it yourself, you can bet your butt that nobody uh, over 18 is going to care enough to defeat stupid local things like that. And it's going to happen all over the place. I don't think that it's uh, you know, an exaggeration. I just see this as a big trend of the middle 80s that people are just going to go hog wild for censorship. So the only way to really fight it is the, the kids who like rock and roll and want to keep it alive had better invest some of their own time and energy in going down to the post office. It, post office. It's absolutely free. Just go in there, you can register to vote, and then keep your eye on what's happening in the local elections. And then in 1986, when these suckers come up for uh, senatorial elections, pull the plug on them. You know, rate them, evaluate their contract, and mm -hmm. get, get the ones that are uh, dangerous out of there. That's well, uh, one of the things that people don't take into consideration about voting is the fact that uh, you can vote for somebody, you can also vote against somebody. Yeah, and the same thing goes for, you know, do you ever consider this, <clears throat> if you got a kid who's listening to this station and he hates his school, mm -hmm. you realize that if you're 18, you can vote about things that'll take care of your school. One of the reasons why the schools are so bad in the United States is because the parents voted their pocketbook during the, the last few elections and put people in office who cut the U.S. school system down to the, this warehousing facility that doesn't really teach you anything and it's, you know, it's a liability. And a lot of the matters uh, that concern the schools are voted for in local elections, like bond issues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can swing that. The, the amount of power that the unregistered 18-year-old voters have in the United States today is the best-kept secret in the world. That's the real moral majority right there. Well, Frank, let me ask you one other question about your own projects. What are you going to be doing for Halloween this year? Well, uh, I'll be in New York and probably just be wandering around from uh, place to place. See, I have to go uh, to New York starting the 20th of October, and I'm going to be there through the... 5th of November. I've got a bunch of interviews and debates and stuff that i got to do. So there won't be a traditional uh, Frank Zappa Halloween show? There won't be a concert because I haven't been able to, I can't even finish my record, let alone go into a concert. <laughs> no, that's, that's what happens when you go to the Senate. It keeps busy. Well, Frank, we want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us this morning. And uh, if ever you're in Philadelphia, you're more than welcome to come on the Morning Zoo and uh, speak your mind as long as you'd like about this topic. Uh, what I would like to have you do, if you would just um, uh, tell people this phone number, it's 818-PUMPKIN, P-U-M-P-K-I-N. It is not a toll-free number. That is the, the area code in the San Fernando Valley. 818 pumpkin and if you can call that number and give us your name and address we'll send you free of charge a little packet of information about this stuff and uh, even if you're not 18 and you can't vote you know you still have the right to write to your congressman to your senator to anybody in your local government you have you have the right to make your voice felt even though you can't uh, vote for them or against them yet but one of the reasons why this thing has gotten so out of control is do you realize the PMRC has received only 10,000 letters? And, and probably most in support. Well, I mean, yeah, and the reason they received the 10,000 letters is because they sent out a fundraising mailing. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever heard of them before they sent out their fundraising mailing, and if you compare their 10,000 letters versus 30 million units for the last Michael Jackson album, you can see who the majority is here. Well, thank you, Frank, and th thanks for speaking to us here on the zoo this morning. Okay, we'll see you. You have a good day. Yeah, bye-bye.